Hello, friends. Kyle Mann here at the Babylon Bee Podcast. Just hanging out in my living room today, as one does. I heard a rumor that there's a couple of Latter-day Saints wandering around the neighborhood here. Um, so I'm trying to be quiet and lay low so that they don't catch me. Uh, I think one of them's named Jeff Harmon and one of them's named Neil Harmon. And they have their Jewish friend Matt with them. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of looking out the window here and... Uh, Crap, they saw me. Yeah. I'm there. Do you have a few minutes to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He's also your Lord and Savior. No, that's not the same thing. But we can, I would love to have a discussion with you about this over a cup of co uh, water. Why don't you come on in, the Harmon Brothers of Angel Studios? Well, welcome everyone to the Babylon Bee interview show. Today, it's not so much an interview show as it is a sitcom. This is the new sitcom known as A Jew, uh, an Evangelical, and... <laughs> hold on, let me take a breath. Two members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day <laughs> <laughs> That would have been much shorter to say a few years ago, but uh, we're, we're going with that now. So we're here to talk about... A crazy story of how Angel Studios came to be and and uh, how you guys survived many many crazy things that happened to you. But first, I mean, you guys, the chosen. You know, that's obviously the, the massive hit that that got a, got the ball rolling for everything. So where are you guys at right now? Production of the chosen. We had Dallas Jenkins on. I don't know a few months ago, and that was of course a great time. But uh, I don't know. Spill the beans. What's going on with the chosen right now? Yeah. Well, Jeffrey just got back from Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. Last week I got back from Brazil. I moved my family down there in February for five months. We've got five kids because we realized in order to bring the chosen worldwide, you have to, um, you just have to dig in and get into the countries. My wife's Brazilian. So we moved down there, put our kids in school and then I just dug in and built a team there. So Chosen's exploding. Brazil now is more daily active users than the U.S. for the Chosen. Um, just got back from that. We just finished f filming while I was in Brazil, the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. Yeah. I went down for the feeding of 5,000. We had 9,000 people sh show up. It was so many people. They did it in two days. Um, and honestly, Kyle, if I hadn't been part of this story, then... I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. 10,000 people yeah. from 36 countries show up in Texas to reenact the feeding the 5,000. In 5, the blazing 000. heat. Like a, like, a, like a really, really, really um, miserably hot Comic-Con <laughs> in a field. <laughs> they clearly didn't come for the food. Uh, <laughs> yeah, how'd you guys feed them all? Cosplay event. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what, uh, one of the angel engineers uh, was down there with his team, and he said to his team, just when you see all these people coming, for them, this is like coming to Disneyland, but better. And, and they were confused. And, and, uh, and then as they showed up and, and saw people's faces, they were like, You're, you, weren't, you weren't kidding. This is a huge deal in everybody's life. And... Um, and so the chosen, uh, you, you joked at the beginning about a Jew, uh, Matthew uh, connected uh, Jeffrey and, and me with uh, with Dallas many years ago, and uh, and it was like I said, I wouldn't believe the story if I hadn't been part of it. But we were trying to survive a huge multi million dollar battle with Disney. Dallas was the son of a famous evangelical author who had just come out of a, you know, a, a, a terrible theatrical release. And then we set out to, 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 to make this show and we wanted to make the flagship show for Angel Studios. Um, so you guys didn't go with Left Behind 4 as the <laughs> project to launch <laughs> this whole thing. <laughs> no, no, we did not. We did not. But, uh, but and, and it's working. Like it, it's truly blazing the trail for for all all the creators who want to 
mm-hmm. who, uh, who, who want to do something, uh, yeah. tell a story. That uh, the goal would. was when we met with Dallas is we're going to create the house of cards for angel studios. House of Cards is Netflix series, their original, like their very first one that they did. Mm-hmm. And it, it is what gave Netflix the foothold they needed in order to become a studio, uh, uh, to, to, to launch original content. And so when we met with Dallas and Amanda, that was, that's the goal we embarked on was just, can we, can we take this concept of the chosen and turn it into a trailblazer for a lot of other content for decades and a, hopefully over a century to come? Way, way more behind the story, but, um, <laughs> yeah, this is, um, I, I, yeah, I, and, 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 and it's really important. Like, um, HBO, I don't know if you know this, HBO got its start with stand up. That's how they got their start in the early days. But then, um, you know, these huge shows are, are what make, are, are what make this possible. So for HBO, that was Game of Thrones. Netflix, they were in the DVD and, and then streaming business, and but they, they weren't in the creative business. And then House of Cards put them on the map. So we said to, to Dallas and Amanda, and, and they said to us, let's do this. Like, we'll build the Angel Network, and, um, and you guys will make an amazing show. And, um, and now it's happening, so it's pretty exciting. It's incredible. It's now, who are you? Who's the Jewish guy? The- yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> this is Matthew Ferrante. So, so <laughs> I will never forget. I will never forget as long as I live the day I met Dallas. Uh, there, it was this studio that was um, that was putting together his movie, The Resurrection. Did you ever see Gavin Stone, Resurrection of Gavin Stone? I watched approximately twelve minutes of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I no got fenced to Dallas. No, he I was on. I told him as much when he was on the show. I got I got um, brought in, and and they had this conga line of different consultants coming through, and I just decided I was so fed up with Hollywood, I was just going to express how stupid I thought everybody was, and I sort of said that like nobody knows how to market these movies, blah blah blah, and there was all these consultants in the room, and Dallas was sitting like right here, and he just he he was you know how he's very intent he looking at me and I could just tell that we both felt the same way. So when, anyway, we ended up working on that movie together, which was how we met, uh, which was how we intersected with the Babylon Bee because uh, Adam was, Ford was running it in those days. And Dallas was very impressed with the Babylon Bee from the very beginning. We all connected and tried to do something for that project. It didn't work out. And Dallas told me, let's save it for a big project. I had no idea how big he meant that next project was going to be. But um, when Gavin Stone failed, I remember because I was standing at the Beverly Center on the phone with him, and he was just, he was done. He just said, I'm done. I don't even know if I'm going to make any movies anymore. I'm just, I'm just finished. And, um, and then I don't know how long the, the gap was, but he sent me the, I guess, what became The Shepherd. I don't even know if it had a name. Did you mm-hmm. see the original that yeah, first that, that yeah. first video, that little pilot or whatever you want yeah. to call it. Yeah. So, I called him and I said, <clears throat> "Well, it's interesting that you said you're done because this is the best thing I've ever seen you do. I mean, this is incredible." Um, and then I hunted these two guys down and said, "You got you got to watch this thing. This is this is something." And he made it for his church. So I don't even know. Do you guys remember? Was there a aside from the fact that he made it for his church? Was there a design behind? I think maybe he wanted to make it into a show, but I don't know. So you, you sent it to me. I, I looked at it and I, I had this like feeling like this could be a TV series. And I called you and I was like, Matthew, yeah. can this be a TV series? And you were like, I think it could be a TV series. I think he's thought of some stuff like that. Yeah. And then you connected to me and Dallas said, yeah, I've got a TV series in mind. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, okay. this could be the pilot Dallas. He's like, it's not a pilot. It's a Christmas special. And I'm like, just call it a pilot. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> anyway, but, um, but I think uh, the the story up until that moment, like, is so critical to understand how big of a moment that is for Angel oh, Studios. Oh, it was huge. It was huge. We're, we grow up. We grew up in uh, Idaho. Neil and I did. We were from nine kids. So I'm the middle of nine. Neil's a little older than me. Third. And yeah, the third. And and we grew up poor on this little farm in Idaho. Our nearest neighbors are a quarter mile away. Like, for example, my wife's from the third largest city in the world, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And 
she, we we arrive in Utah and Provo, and she's like, it's so nice to live in the country. And I'm like, this is the city. And, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, no, this isn't the city. This is the country. And I'm like, it has sidewalks. It's the city. <laughs> I was like, if I can't walk out in the backyard and leave myself without neighbors seeing me, this is the city. <laughs> and so that's, that's the kind of world that we came from. And, um, and then our family was very, um, I mean, just, just scraping by, just scrape, scraping by. And Neil came up, I mean, we, we, we were a little entrepreneurs from the time we were little kids. Mm -hmm. So Neil at- He's eight, had a little potato stand out on the sidewalk and- I did. Yeah. 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 At 11 years old, I took potatoes from my grandpa's <laughs> farm in Idaho loaded them up in my dad's car when he would drive down to Utah and I would set up potato stands and sell potatoes on the side of the road. Me. All right. <laughs> you really nailed it. Brother. You nailed it. You, you were kidding? Yeah, I was joking. No, no, for real. I did that. I, he, was, I, he was being prophetic. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I took... I took I'm took. sensing potatoes. <laughs> Someone in this room. Yeah. I'm smelling maybe some vinegar here in your past. Uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so I, I took... I, I, I took down 600 pounds of potatoes to my grandpa's neighborhood. He's a professor at a university in Utah. And he is, and I go to his neighbors and I would, I would, first I knocked on their doors and I would say, hi, I'm Frank Harmon's grandson, 11 year old. Um, I'm selling fresh Idaho potatoes to pay for school. And I was trying to go to a private school that this girl I liked was in. Yeah. And, um, as one does. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then I, I sold $110 an hour that first time. And I was 11 year old. And I was like, oh, this is way better than anything else I can do, which I mean, technically I'm probably not even supposed to work under labor laws, but, <laughs> but I, so, and then I, I just started doing it. And then eventually I set it up in the streets where I had like little potato stands and I would sell, I mean, my first, my first vehicle was with my older brother, Daniel. Um, we bought a 15 passenger. Well, you got to tell him why. So, so <laughs> yeah. Okay. So on the farm, I went to my uncle and I would borrow his vehicles <laughs> and drive potatoes down to Utah. I'd just be like, can I buy, this is when I'm 15, when we could get a driver's license in Idaho. It's 15 years old. So I go borrow a vehicle from him. I'm still selling potatoes because it works well. And I drive his vehicles down and I'm putting tons of miles on him. And so one day he shows up with this 15 passenger van that he bought from a copper mine on auction that's falling apart. It has two, 300,000 miles on it. He's like, <laughs> here's your new potato vehicle. You owe me $900. <laughs> I stopped driving my vehicle. <laughs> so we pay him Stop nine. Stop leeching. <laughs> yeah, we pay him $900 and we've got this huge 15 passenger Ford Econoline van and a 15 and a 17 year old driving down to Utah selling potatoes. And um, we paid, that, that was our living. That was our business. So, but Neil's story... <laughs> Oh, you're good. You're good. I, I started a cow, cow cow farm for my. I'm and, sensing and cow cow farm. Yes, and then and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I also uh, sold like I buy Costco goods and sell them in my school in order to pay for for my schooling. So but we, we had, all did stuff. Neil that, had a, like a little sheet of paper that he had written out the probability of a cow having twins. He knew the probability. And he said, I will get that probability. My cow will have twins. And then those cows will have twin females. <laughs> those cows. And I will be a millionaire off of one cow by the time I'm And 18. by the way, this is the marketing plan for the chosen. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <clears throat> yeah, there was a farmer who cow I was sharing. pyramid scheme. <laughs> There's a farmer I was sharing my plan with. And he said, you're, the you're going to be the next J.R. Simplot of Idaho. And I said, J.R. Simplot's the Simplot? only Idaho billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know who that is. Uh, <laughs> and, and actually, Kyle, how I met these guys, which is kind of hilarious, is I was working with all the studios to try to get them to do in L.A. to try to get them to, well, eat, not only make more fam family-friendly content, but they had existing family-friendly content that they weren't really marketing very well. And uh, you know, you know this. Is it Hobson's choice the right? It's that choice where you can either watch, like you get your kids, and you can either watch something with them, and it's clean, but it's probably fifty years old, or you see something you really want to watch, but you can't because it's got stuff you don't want your kids to see yeah. in it, right? So some pastor, Brian Schwartz, who's a former uh, Jaguars linebacker, actually, 
and he has lots of kids, called me one day and he goes, bro, you got to see this thing called VidAngel. It's the best. So I went, I checked it out and I saw that you could pull up a movie and take out the bad words and take out the sex scenes. And it was like a whole new, I was like, there's so many things I can show my kids. They can see back to the future now. They can see, you know, all these movies that I loved as a kid, but didn't realize how much bad stuff was in them. And so I called Neil, what, totally out of the blue, right? And just said, I want you to know you're gonna change the world. Whatever you're doing, I wanna be a part of what you guys are doing. We don't need Hollywood with, with what you guys have. And that's how we first connected however many years ago, six years ago or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll take us back to the beginning of VidAngel. Yeah. We were just trying to, uh, I, telling you a couple of stories because uh, entrepreneurism is kind of in our blood uh, growing up on farms and being part of a large, poor family. And so we've, we've had a string of entrepreneurial experiences and we finished a, a company called Aura Brush. And after that, uh, Jeffrey and I were... Uh, Wait a minute. You got to tell Kyle what Aura Brush did. So Aura Brush is a tongue cleaner that helped get rid of bad breath. And it was the first company that, that made money on YouTube. And um, to the point that uh, Google invited us out to speak um, at YouTube. And uh, they also came out to visit us. And Jeffrey helped them uh, develop the skippable pre-roll ad, which we all love. So you can skip your ads and, uh, and just the advertisers that are really successful. Don't get skipped. We love that too. Um, and um, we'd built an ad agency. And Jeffrey was like 16 yep. at the time, right? When you did No, that? I was just done with school. I'm tempted. <laughs> uh, university. <laughs> and, and coming out of that, we, we, we did an ad agency. And then, um, and then after the ad agency, we started VidAngel for our own kids. Well, and I had read um, Creativity Inc. and realized that Pixar was an ad agency before they were yeah. a studio. So that was mm -hmm. intriguing. It was like, huh, is it possible that we could... I mean, it was weird that we were even in an ad agency because we grew up with three three TV stations. We didn't watch a lot of content. I mean, uh, my f I went to the theater maybe, I could count the number of times I went to the theater growing up on one hand. And um, But we had ended up in the ad agency world, and which was a mixture of potato cells for me, <laughs> plus having a roommate who was a filmmaker. It looks good on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> 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 yeah. So my roommate was a film major and he introduced me to film. And so we were making stuff that sold things. And we made this commercial for a tongue cleaner called Ore Brush that blew up. Then we build an ad agency and then we end up doing poopery, squatty potty, purple mattress, Lumi deodorant. These are unicorn type projects. I mean, one of them is literally a unicorn project, but the, uh, <laughs> they're, they're these massive, <laughs> Massive campaigns, and um, and so we build this ad agency. And during that time, it, it, just reading Creativity Inc. made me go, "Oh, Ed Catmull's from uh, from my culture. He's he's from I think he grew up in. He went to the University of Utah. Yeah, so he went to the I University of Utah, yeah. and I was and so he inspired me to think maybe we could do more than this. And Neil, you can tell about what you were thinking. Well, um, l when we grew up on, on a farm, our, our, our parents were very strict about content. Like we weren't allowed to watch a PG-13 movie in our home. And so when we started having, and we thought that was a real drag and, and, uh, and, and embarrassing. But then when we had our own young, young children, um, we said, you know, we love good storytelling, but, um, you know, my, I don't want my 10 year old son repeating some of the words to his younger sisters. And so I started tinkering and figured out how to make uh, a streaming movie, skip those words. And uh, the first movie I did was Cinderella Man, which is a favorite movie of mine. You just mute the words, right? Yeah, just mute the words. And I could wa we could watch the story and, and uh, teach the, the principles of the story without him repeating those words to his kids. About a year after doing that with Cinderella Man, there were a bunch of changes in the market, technologies that became available. And we were trying to think, what are we going to do um, beyond this ad agency? And we talked about making a streaming app that would allow you to skip over stuff you didn't want to see. <clears> like an here. automatic remote. Yeah. Like your dad turning off the TV when it, something bad comes on. Yeah, but it yeah just... that was our vid angel growing up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I got a feature uh, pitch for you guys. This was from, uh, I think Brandon wanted this feature because he uses Vid VidAngel. He wants you to be able to uh, black out the screen but still show the audio. Oh, yeah. On certain scenes. Yes. Because yeah. in like Game of Thrones, there will be important dialogue that happens in a whorehouse. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with what's being said. Yeah. So, so we, that out there. we made a commercial on Game of Thrones mm -hmm. that where this that, that we have a guy pretending to be the director of Game of Thrones, and he's talking about it's how great. the only <laughs> reason why they have so much like sex and nudity in it is because they just don't have budget for wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and so i was watching game of thrones on VidAngel to try to figure out how to make sure the voice was right on this commercial and i go to one of my friends and he's like how are you liking game of thrones now that you're watching it with VidAngel?" and i was like well it's pretty good except for there's this one character that has almost no development <laughs> and he's like oh that's because you're watching on VidAngel." <laughs> he's like Tyrion lannister no, no character <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so you can't you can't be a movie critic when you're watching that way. It's easy. <laughs> so do you guys hire like total heathens to like watch this stuff? And yeah. So long story, but we're not part of the angel anymore. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, so we sold. We sold. Yeah. This the I need the project. I need the the, the but but the, the way we here. built it was that it you, it was crowd filtered. So you get people who would already watch. Like you can't you can't tag. We call it tagging a movie, tagging the scenes can't tag a movie that you wouldn't already watch. So no taking one for the team. You don't get to go. <laughs> uh, yes, I will. I will watch that episode. This is my work for the Lord. I must watch Game yeah. of Thrones. We were, there there's too many guys. people that yeah. were like, and we're like, no taking one for the team. You have to like sign a thing that says, <laughs> I won't watch content that I wouldn't already watch. <laughs> but there's millions of people that watch Game of sure. Thrones. So it's easy to tag. Find a few. Yeah. So there was a DVD technology to skip over to skip, DVDs. Right. We were trying to solve the problem for streaming. For streaming, okay. And um, and the attorneys. And, and so we did a bunch of research, found out all the all the like the landmines. We did some research on how many Americans wanted this product. It was about half of parents wanted this product, and so we said, let's launch this business, and we did. And the attorneys told us they said rather than just going and getting streaming. Buy the DVDs. Well, that that's oh. later. Oh, that's later. So we okay. we we Come on, Jeff. We launched. I'm jumping ahead. We launched. <laughs> we launched one service. Just a simple potato farmer doesn't know when to. <laughs> but we launched a service. Whatever um, you say, Neil. <laughs> okay. On the Chromecast, yeah, go ahead. we launched a service on the Chromecast. It got shut down. We tried to partner with Google Play. They technically shut it down, though. Yeah, they t shut it down technically. We tried to partner with Google Play, and the studios told them no. Uh, um, but it wasn't just, we didn't go to Google Play. They came they to came us. They came to us, yeah. yeah. They said, this is really cool. There was uh, an executive there who said, this is really cool. I'm interested in implementing this in Google Play. And we said, well, you got, you know, the tech got shut down on the Chromecast, so let's give it a shot. He we, took it to the studios and they shut him down. Yeah. We did this video uh, that became our most viral video ever, where there was a family sitting down on a couch in white, and they got pelted with paintballs to represent modern media. Um, and it's, and the change in modern media and it just grew like wildfire. And then that thing got censored. Um, so we're just getting hit and pounded down, pounded down, pounded down every time we try. And, um, we meet a Hollywood attorney, uh, David Quinto, who had represented the Oscars for 30 years. He was the, uh, the founding member of the largest litigation firm in the world and uh, worked for Disney and Warner Brothers and, every, and and we talked to him and said, we've got this problem. There's a law that says that we can skip over stuff but in streaming, but effectively we don't know how to do it. We've tried this way, this way, this way. They keep shutting us down. <laughs> they keep shutting us down. And he's, he reads the law and, um, and he said, you could do it this way. And, and, and then we launched a system where we bought millions of dollars of DVDs and Blu-rays, stuck them in a warehouse, and then we would sell them sell them to, to the customers so that they own them. And then we would filter them online to the customers. And, um, and then he said, as you launch this service, you need, to, you need to write the studios, let them know what you're doing, and get their feedback. So we wrote all like 17 studios, including Disney, and said, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how it makes you money. And uh, this is the law that we're doing it under. If you got any feedback, let us know. And they didn't let us know anything. And uh, we wrote them again. 
And, uh, and then we launched the service because we didn't hear anything from the studios and he said, you're good. So we launched the service and, and a year later got slapped with a lawsuit from Disney. Yeah. So Disney sued us, which was confusing at first until you realized that all the other content becomes more family friendly and more competitive with Disney's content when it's, when you have filtering and we're like, oh, I guess it makes sense. This is, this actually has a financial reason for them yeah, to do this. It always struck me as weird when I heard about this lawsuit that they would care. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if it was like an artistic integrity thing. Like they didn't want movies being shown, like not from mm. the original director's vision. I don't know. Did you guys sense any of that kind of pushback that they didn't want these clean versions? They out felt there? very strongly about keeping the F-bomb in Hamilton. So oh. I think that was probably yeah. an, <laughs> an inspiration, right? <laughs> I actually thought at the time when I called Neil, I actually thought that they were building this to sell it to Disney. I mean, well, when that's, I first that's my met initial them, reaction. You, yeah. you build this back in technology and all these. Yeah, I would think all the studios them, would be would great. They? Like now all these people can watch our stuff. But they're and, not interested in doing that. Yeah. Right. After, that's a good question. Right after the lawsuit started, um, we went to those studios again and we went to LA and started meeting with them and saying, what's going on, guys? We wrote you all. Um, we, but we were only able to visit the ones who didn't sue us. It was just Disney, Warner Brothers, and Fox that sued us, and Fox got assumed into Disney. So it was two major studios. But we met, met with all the others and said, "Thanks for not suing us. Uh, <laughs> we told you what we want. We, we told you what we wanted to do. If you guys don't like this, tell us how you want to do it." And they said, "It is a little untenable unless you can figure out how to get the." the creators on board with the it. directors, the yeah. directors specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they were interested, but they said, we're, you know, we got to maintain the relationship like, with yeah. the directors. They were like, you've got to get a few big ones to fall and then we'll join. Yeah. <laughs> but Disney specifically, I don't think it was about that. Like they, they wanted to look like the, the knight in shining armor who was protecting the directors. But in reality, they were just protecting their market. Like, yeah. So then, Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so what was the outcome of, of So this? we get hit with a lawsuit. It's probably easy to be sued by Disney. That They're not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the... I mean, we found out they're, they're the law firm that represents them. It's like $1,800 an hour yeah. Per, yeah. Per, per attorney. <laughs> and so they sue us. We're, we don't have money. We're just like in growth mode. We were growing like crazy. Very fast. It was growing yes. very fast. Yeah, fast. They sue us. We don't have the money to fight the lawsuit. So either we're going to have to shut down... Or we're going to have to find a way to get money. And there's a new law that Obama had signed that says that average people can invest into a... Because previously, if you, didn't have, if you weren't an accredited investor, which means you're a millionaire, essentially, then you can't invest in non-public companies. But this new law allowed average people to invest a small percentage of their income into crowdfunded projects. And so we went to the crowd and we were the ninth company to ninth, do that. Ninth company history. to try it out. And we went to them and we said, um, we got the guy who helped pass the law, written the book on it. He put together all the legal side of it. And then we went to the crowd and we said, all 14 companies that tried this before got sued. They got shut down. How... Um, the only way that we're going to be able to fight this is if we can get at least $5 million. So we're opening up an opportunity where you can invest in our company and we'll fight the lawsuit if you want us to. And there's a super good chance that we fail. And But we think we got a fighting chance to, to actually win. Um, we did, we, you know, a little bit naive. Um, <laughs> and, sure, we can take on the biggest uh, media company in the world. Yeah, and we're like, but you, you do it, we'll go fight it. And we raised $10 million in five days from over wow. 8,000 yeah. families across the world just came and poured in and said, we want you to fight this battle for us. Let's go, let's go mm -hmm. to war. And so we get that done. Um, the attorneys are really confident in our case. And they're also saying, if you, if Disney waits a year to sue you and you're making them money, you're going to be able to operate while the, legal, while the battle, legal stuff gets figured out. Yeah. While it gets figured out. Yeah. So they're like, there's no way that they're going to get, get what's called a preliminary injunction where they, they actually shut you down right. before right. because it's going to harm them and it's urgent to shut us down a year after we had launched the judge 
and joins the company and shuts us down. Uh (laughs) It's an LA judge, downtown LA. And the reason I remember the the few hundred thousand goal is because somebody in the industry had told us, your dream to make your own stories, don't jump into that until you at least have a million people that are paying you. And um, and we got to about two hundred, you know, a few hundred thousand. Well, it's a few hundred thousand monthly payments. Yes, right? yeah, the people who are paying regularly, and um, and it was December twelfth, two thousand sixteen. We were having a big company party. We were in new offices. You've been out to our offices, Kyle, um, and we were in that new building. We'd just gotten in there, and we we're having a party. And then that night, six p.m., the injunction order comes out. We get up at five a.m. the next morning. Uh, with the leadership team, we changed the whole second day of our company meeting, invite the press in. And we said, you know what, there's not going to be another chance to do it. We didn't ever get to a million people, but let's uh, go ahead and launch the Angel Studios now. And um, and and the first thing that we did was, uh, was Dry Bar. Uh, it's a stand-up comedy show. Right. So Dry Bar is the first yep. original content from Angel Studios and stand-up comics. I know a lot of those clips, I would see them go viral on Facebook. That's probably how a lot of people started to get, because it's, it's great for social media engagement. Yep. Um, now you guys got it nailed down. You bring in co- comics and uh, how, how long in advance do you tape these before they just come about, out? They're usually a month or two before a month or they two, come yeah. out. Yeah. And um, and we just set it up like a machine. And you just bulk, do a bunch of comedians at once and like yep. machine type. Do four comedians every but, weekend. But with a unique twist, right? Because we started this whole thing because we were wanting stories yeah. for our kids. And so we said to the comedians, you come in, you perform here. The audience rates you. And you got to be rated well enough that you even get published. And about two thirds of them make it past that first stage. And then after that, we have a bonus pool that when uh, people don't skip like right, right. bad words, you get a bonus. Like you get paid more. <laughs> and as soon as that happened, um, we, didn't then the comedi- we didn't have to police it. And then people would come in, they'd bend over backwards for the audience and do this amazing stand-up because we had funny comedians who nor- aren't normally clean coming in and performing for this audience. And it was and, and the result was huge. Like we it, have billions is, of views. Mostly established comedians that you guys are going after or... No, medium. These are medium. these are veteran comedians that have never had their break. Gotcha. And we moneyballed it. It was just like, what if we bring in 50 of them? Can we find the gold ones, the ones that just nobody's like discovered yet and make them big? That was the idea. And it ended up working. Like yeah. it took us 18 months, three seasons and like $3 million of investment. So it was it was horrifying. <laughs> it was so, <laughs> so scary. But but in each season when we would green light a new season, it was like, are we just burning money? <laughs> 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 so um so Jeff making dry bar work was no laughing matter. Uh it was it was really it was it was scary. And go ahead. Kyle, Kyle's like doom doom. <laughs> <laughs> So VidAngel had to completely redo its business model. At what point did you guys spin off Angel Studios, VidAngel, break that off? So uh, Angel Studios, we actually renamed VidAngel as Angel okay. Studios last year. Gotcha. So that we've been we've been as Angel Studios for a year, but the, but we called it VidAngel Studios before that. Because yeah. we were just looking for the right name. We wanted Angel Studios. It just took us a long time to get the domain. Yeah. Yeah. And then as soon as we got the domain, we separated them. Gotcha. Sold the filtering. The filtering protect, is sold. Okay. To protect. Because the filtering in its heyday made like $8 million. Last year, we did over $122 million. Mm-hmm. Like the orig- telling the stories is where the real battles fought, mm-hmm. as you sure. guys know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so um, that's what that was what the goal was. Well, and if you go back, we raised that money, the, fi- the, fi- the $10 million in five days. Daniel, who's a director... My, our brother that's mm-hmm. in between us, he calls me the day we ri- finished raising that money. And he's just like, Jeff, do you realize what this means? We can raise big budget funds for legitimate series and movies like Hollywood does, but from the crowd. And I was like, oh, <laughs> we actually have a path to that vision Neil had of making that content. And so we're building Drybar. At this point, now we're now we're working on Drybar, 
And I'm thinking, okay, we just did one through a bigger crowdfunding round that wasn't necessarily specifically for dry bar comedy, but to fight a lawsuit and to build a new business. Mm -hmm. um, now, what is going to be the show, right? The show that we do, we launched this whole entire um, this, model. this model. model off of, of not having to go to a Hollywood executive and beg them for money. You can go to the crowd, show them what you want to build and see if they'll rally around it and help you create your show. And so I'm looking for that. Neil's fighting the legal battle and Disney's just pounding us. It's, um, you can, yeah, well, they, they, I mean, to the point of threatening to sue us, uh, personally, it's still the first lawsuit. This is it's ongoing. This yes. Is the Disney suit. Yes. This okay. is the Disney suit and we're trying to build dry bar and, and we're, we're running down low. We got within like 40 days of the end of our runway. And it was, um, around that time when Matthew sent, um, Jeffrey, the, 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 the shepherd. Yeah. So I'm looking where Neil has told me that he had come to me and said, you know, one of our really good attorney called us and he said, I have an idea for you guys. When a predator company is coming after a little company, there is what's called chapter 11 bankruptcy. And he's like, you can use that to actually as a shield. One of the, the laws allows you to use chapter 11 as the shield. It's not like you're going under, it's like you're protecting yourself from a predator. And he's like, you guys should use this to stop Disney. And so Neil comes to me and he says, we're gonna file chapter 11 bankruptcy as a, as a strategic move on Disney. Matthew Faraci sends me this, this short film from Dallas Jenkins. I watch it and it's like the whole, all the other things just disappear and while I'm watching this, this little story on a shepherd who is the lowest in his society. Shepherds are the lowest and then he's a crippled shepherd. So he's like lower than the lowest. And it, and he's kicked, he's an outcast, not just from the synagogues and everywhere, but he's also an outcast from his own shepherds. And they are visited by the angels and he gets to see baby Jesus for the first time. And as I'm watching this, it's just like for the next hours after a flood of information, just like, it's just like coming into to my mind about how to use this show as a pilot episode to crowdfund a series. And it's all just starting to come together. All these years and years of work are starting to come together in my mind. And I go to Neil the next day and I said, Neil, I think I found what we're gonna launch the crowdfunding system with for films. And Neil's like, what is it? And I was like, it's a Bible show. And he's like, no, we're not doing a Bible show. <laughs> 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 I no, <laughs> no. Why? I, I and it's totally tied into the branding of and the churches should be doing this, not not a for profit organization, etc. And I said, Neil, just watch it, just watch the show. And Neil puts on his earphones, he watches, it, and I just remember him taking him off and just saying, Jeff, this is why we made Angel Studios. This is why we did this. And um, and uh, I mean. It, it, the when when that happened and i watched the show it, the world completely vanished around me and i was there for the birth of christ that's what it felt like to me and then i remembered all those people uh from many years before and that's why after i pulled off my headphones i said to jeff i i, th I think this is why we created bit angel and i said okay neil Matthew Faraci says he might have a series. He's going to connect to me. Um, but here's some problems. I've identified at least five reasons <laughs> why, why he may not want to work with us. <laughs> the first one was we're in a Disney with the largest studio in the world, and this is a Hollywood director. You know, we're, we're in a Disney ba di battle with Disney. Number yep, two, good point. Matthew Faraci said he does not like filtering. Matthew had brought it up before. He doesn't like this idea of skipping things in movies. Because he's a director. He's a director. Right? Yeah. yeah. You're going to ruin my art kind of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, number three is, um, is the fact that we're crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is crazy. There's only, 
I mean, we were the ninth company to try it. <laughs> and, and so this is super high risk on that front. Number four is we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints. And his dad is gotta the most- Gotta be a most, shorter way to say that. Yeah, gotta be a shorter way. <laughs> Latter-day Saints. I'll brainstorm. <laughs> Kyle will come back to us with some ideas. Uh, and so, so there, there, I was like, his dad wrote the Left Behind series. This guy is like hardcore evangelical. And evangelicals, as far as I understand, don't really jive with our- our uh, doctrines. Which, if I can interject, back in, during the lawsuit, the evangelicals were the first to come to our aid. Absolutely. That's fair. Yes. That's fair. We Absolutely. Had, when, when we got sued, we had Thousand friends percent. that would, pastors that would call us and say, can I pray with you? Yes. Because I believe you guys are going to make it. And it was, there, it was, it was consistently the evangelical mm. community that was our best friend. Thousand yes. percent. I yes. remember. I remember going to. How were that, the Jews? Were the Jews good to you? They were good friends too. <laughs> yeah, in trial, in trial, when we were sitting in the courtroom, <laughs> there were little families, little that Jewish would come. families in LA would show up with all their little kids, and they would watch the trial while the Disney side was full of suits and attorneys and law school students. So yeah, yeah. Some so, of whom were probably also Jews, but let's just we'll just ignore that. <laughs> um, Different Jews. But I, I will say, yeah, back in the beginning, I remember. Um, um, Kyle, there were, I went to so many leaders that I knew that you and I, I'm sure both know and now Neil and Jeff do. And, uh, they, they, they loved, um, the idea of VidAngel and growing up as I did in the pro-life movement, the way I was raised, um, all these different people from different faiths came together around the life issue. And so to me, that was the way that it should be. What did Reagan say? Uh, Somebody agrees with you 75% 70 of the time is your friend, right? And so to me, it just made sense. What VidAngel's doing is consistent with the values of Jews, of Christians, of you know anybody really that, that holds to either the Bible or let's just say general biblical moral values, you could put it that way. And so... Or the it, Bible plus a few other books. Yeah. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so uh, he's referring to the Talmud. Uh, so correct. yeah, he's referring to the Talmud. <laughs> uh, so uh, so yeah, they were that we had a ton of support mm -hmm. at the beginning at, at the at, at, from leaders, yes. Dr. Dobson and so many yes. other people that these guys rallied around us. Yeah, it was awesome. So <laughs> so anyway, I'm and then I and then I said Neil. So we've got those four things, and the fifth thing is we're filing Chapter Eleven bankruptcy. <laughs> like, and I said we better tell him that before he leaves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so I called Dallas and I start going over with him, and I'm just explaining about our success with Dry Bar Comedy, Poopery, Purple Mattress, Lumi Deodorant. I'm just trying <laughs> to like everything I can to get him interested. And he's and at the end of the conversation, he said, "Okay, let's look at it." And I was like, "This was a two hour conversation." I was like, "Oh." my potato sales paid off. No, <laughs> I was like, I'm either a really good salesman or he's really desperate right now. Um, come to find out it's a little bit of both. But the, uh, <laughs> um, so, so he, I said, well, then you need, I'm going to fly you and your wife out here and you guys need to come meet our families. You need to meet our office. You need to, I mean, we are very different culture than what you come from. We, if we're going to like, get, get into this marriage. You guys got to come out here and like, get to know what you're getting into. So he and Amanda. How literal marriage. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so them. yeah, business, business. <laughs> uh, I mean, these days you don't have to Oh, sorry. <laughs> that is the wrong way to describe what I just described. But so they, <laughs> they, they fly out and they, they meet with us. We worship together. We, we go and we're just chatting the whole time and we actually kick it off really, really well. And at the end of the trip, Dallas and Amanda said, okay, let's do it. We're going to make the flagship series for this new, new platform, studio. new studio yeah. around this, this shepherd. And, and then Daryl and I were really, really bullish because we felt so good about it. And we're like, we're just going to launch this. Everybody's going to flock around it. It took us 18 months. And getting Angel down to less than how many days of runway? Like 40 days. Yeah. So we throw the entire, we, we bet, bet the farm, to use an Idaho term. <laughs> <laughs> bet we, the potato farm. Yeah. Yeah. We, we bet the farm on this show. 
I pull most of the team resources just to work on this project. And we don't have many left. And we're subsiding off of dry bar revenues are just starting to pick up. And yeah, dry bar picked up just in time to yes. keep us alive. And so, and then we launch and we eventually over 18 months, we get 19,000 investors to invest almost $10 million, just about $10 million when it closed to build season one of the chosen. And it was like crawling on glass. I Dallas had quit his job at his church that he had been working at before. Daryl was helping him keep his life afloat. Um, we were, I mean, every single day was just like barely, uh, uh, Dallas's wife, Amanda calls it the, the, that we were on the mana program. <laughs> we were just getting enough <laughs> to take day, the next to go to the next and day. Do you remember also guys in, in those early days, I'll never forget it. Cause when I hear people that like the show now, I appreciate that. But in those early days, you guys helped us. Kirk Cameron helped us. Yes. The piano guys helped us. Yes. There was like a, I'm trying to remember all the influencers, but there was, there was a lot of influencers who for free. Dobson did, uh, helped. Dr. Dobson, Ravi Zacharias was yes. in, Ann Graham Lotz was in. I'm trying to remember there was, but basically I called in and Dallas called in everybody Every favor knew, you could. Every favor we ever had and said, hey, can you help us with this? And, and we were calling in every favor we could within our world. People jumped in. A lot of people yes. deserve, deserve a lot of credit because they jumped in for free. Yes. My faith. It's not just us in. crawling on glass. There were so many people, people coming in. People that just in. supported us. And, yep. and, and, but from our side, we're looking at it and saying, we're in chapter 11. We're fighting off this lawsuit. We are almost out of money. Now, once the chosen raises its money, it agreed that it would pay us back what we had invested. And, um, but that, that was a risk. Like we're, we're dumping mm -hmm. money into something that may or may not have enough, you know, gas to get us there. And, um, and then we get enough money to film episodes one through four and they start, they start filming and it's beautiful. And, um, and then it's like, now we got to launch this. How are we going to launch it? We don't any longer have very many people watching the system for the filtering like we had planned. We have to come up with a new way to build this platform. And so we just start testing all different kinds of models. We ran hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests to figure out how to build a model to monetize episodes one through four when they were done. And while Dallas is filming. Uh, in a very simple way at the ad agency, our goal is to bring in a viewer and have that viewer earn more money than it cost us to get the viewer. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we that's, build. That's what, that, and, and once you figure out that equation, then you can scale a project. And uh, we struggled to find that equation with the chosen for a year. Yeah, or, or yeah, close to a yeah. Year. We were sitting there just just grinding, and I, I mean, I feel really bad. An entrepreneur, this is kind of like we've already started a bunch of businesses, and this was the hardest period I've ever been through. I can't imagine what someone like Dallas, who's just a f filmmaker, who's not an entrepreneur by heart and is just getting dragged. I mean, he's got to feel like he's just been hooked to the back of horses and just like, we're just like <laughs> dragging him through all this terrible, like it's a heavy, heavy load that we put on these guys. And, and in the middle of that, we end up in trial with Disney in LA for a week. For a week. and get With a the number two person at Disney there the entire time, the, the general counsel. And, and they... You remember, remember I said that uh, we tried to approach Google. We were, had a Google executive who was going to be a witness. Judge threw out the Google witness right last minute. Um, our attorney said there's no way you would ever uh, get a willful infringement charge because you had advice of, attorney, of, of counsel. Well, the judge somehow ruled that we couldn't even defend ourselves as having the advice of counsel so that they could get a willful charge and, uh, and, and dig just, a grave. Just throwing out that guy from Google, he was now working at Netflix. He says, I'm getting pressure from all over the place to not go do this, but I'm going to go do it even if, didn't he say, if it costs yes. me my job? Yeah. He shows up the morning to court to, to testify of what had happened. And the judge says, you can't come in. Mm. He holds him out of the courtroom. Then the judge says he's irrelevant. 
right? That's what he said. Then he lets another witness from Disney get up and talk Testify to about the meetings Google. that guy had. <laughs> <laughs> so they're there it's just like it's just like a sham trial like yeah. and and neil's up in front with and they ask him why did you do make a certain decision that looks like willful infringement and neil has in his journal i have a line written in my journal and i just basically repeated the line and then the whole courtroom explodes yeah so he's, he's like he's like i was i was praying about what i should do and I wrote down this line in my journal. The words that came to my mind is follow, follow the advice, advice of, of your counsel. counsel. <laughs> and, and we're not supposed to use that terminology in the courtroom because the judge has ruled we can't use advice of counsel as a defense. But they directly asked me a question and I had to answer it honestly. <laughs> so, so I answered it and then the whole courtroom blew up. Uh, and the judge is like, you can't use that word. So you get the $62 million judgment handed down. And I assume you had $62 million on you at the time. <laughs> <laughs> in small bills ready to hand over yeah yeah they, it was it was that judgment was built to put us out of business they they knew that they had done a pretty weak um trial that won't hold up against appeals but they knew that if they got a high enough judgment that uh, the bankruptcy court would f likely flip us into chapter, chapter seven. seven that's what would normally happen which is which is Involuntary liquidation, which means all your assets get sold to others, and and that would have end of story. That would have happened immediately in most cases, but we had already filed Chapter Eleven as a protection. Which, at the time we filed Chapter Eleven, it was like a year before, right? Or it was almost a year before we had filed it. It seemed kind of crazy, like nobody understood <clears throat> why. But Neil had had these. It was kind of a spiritual prompting to to do chapter eleven, and then and then we go well, and it bought us it bought us enough time to get dry bar going to where dry bar was succeeding, and then it bought us enough time to actually get cho the chosen launched. So it bought us a year where we could put off trial for a year and rebuild the business. That's right. Um, and then once we got the judgment, um, it also bought us arguments that we should hold off we shouldn't do that we shouldn't do the forced liquidation we should see whether there's something to save in this business yeah and so that night after the judgment my wife was there Annie Ellie she was there and we're just like sitting in the hotel room and I just like leaned over on her lap and just wept because it had been years of battling and i was just waiting for like what something to save us you know like a miracle yeah, right and um and realizing this is this is it we're gonna we're gonna go down in flames and uh matthew like you said matthew was in shock too yeah i, I couldn't even couldn't even like speak yes I remember i was incoherent because it when they when they dropped the judgment i never thought it was going to hit and the only way i can describe it kyle is um it was like a wave, like an invisible wave just hit me because I thought like you, I thought somehow this is going to work out. And I, and I, and, and I, it was shocking to me because I just thought there's no way that we're going to, we're going to lose. And then we did so fantastically. And I just, I couldn't even process it in my brain that it was, mm -hmm. it was so fantastic. 60, that, that size of judgment was just so Impossible. Impossible, yeah. yeah. But two things happened that night. Three things that got me thinking. First one was is one of the attorneys asked me if, he could, if I could go over to his hotel room and pray with him because uh, he was so surprised. And um, praying with him, the words came like, it's time to stand back and watch God. Um, the second thing is my wife driving back from that. And that was my words that I didn't even believe, but the spirit was speaking to me. My wife says, Jeff, our God is stronger than corrupt judges and um, Disney. And, and then we get back and I asked Neil to pray for me because I was struggling so much. And in his prayer, he, he same kind of words, Jeff, 
Angel Studios will be saved. And um, and I was like, I, I, I wrote in my journal, I, I don't believe it, but I'll work like it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe these words, even though the spirit's there, but I'll work like this is true. And um, and so we get we we regroup and we go and Disney had had filed two two things. One had come because of a strategic move Neil and our attorneys had made while we were in trial that convinced them to file a ask for a trustee ask for a trustee to be over our company, which we thought was a bad thing at the moment. Then they file to force us into Chapter Seven. They get up in front of the court and in the bankruptcy courts in Utah because we filed chapter 11 get up in front of this bankruptcy attorney, a bankruptcy judge. And they say it is impossible for a company to be rehabilitated from a 62 point, whatever million dollar judgment that has so little revenues. This is, you just need to turn it over into bankruptcy. And we offered, we said, well, they filed two motions. One is to put a trustee and one is for chapter seven. We will voluntarily put a trustee in place and the trustee can assess whether or not we should be put into chapter seven, not us, not Disney. The trust- third, an objective third party. Yes. And Neil came to me with this idea of doing a trustee and I was like, no, you're going to get some attorney to walk in. Disney could probably buy them off or whatever. And they're just going to turn our company over and liquidate us. And I went and prayed about it. And the word Lazarus came to my mind and I, and I looked up the scriptures about Lazarus and I just had this feeling like if God can raise Lazarus from the dead, I, he said, if I can raise Lazarus from the dead, certainly I can raise a company from the dead. That's easy. <laughs> you know, like, this is, and I felt peaceful about it. And I said, all right, Neil, let's surrender our company to a trustee. We have no more control. And we went and we did this and it was actually a miracle that we even got Disney to do it because our one rule was they couldn't change the trustee once we picked one. That's right. We said you, we're going to do an th- objective third party, but you can't just change them like Whenever you can you under the like law. Them. You got to agree not to change Cause them. Because normally you can change them under the law, but because we came in voluntarily in front of the court, Disney was like, okay, we'll do it. Yeah. And that turned out to be the, the trustee comes in. He says, we're probably going to liquidate the company. I don't see how we're... What, what did he say? No, he said he when he came in, he says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna watch what's going on for uh, a few weeks or months. I'm gonna and when I determine you're the bad actor, I'm gonna ram it down your throat, and you, you won't know what would hit you." Um, he says, "I'm gonna do the same thing on Disney's side too." If they're a bad actor, if they're the bad actor, and um, and then it, we were in that process. The law with the doesn't trustee. allow you to use a ruling just to destroy a business. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't remember how long it was after the trustee came. I think he came on in the fall and then by March of the next year, we were growing so fast that the trustee proposed to the judge that we pay off the entire $62 million. But getting to that, we're with the chosen. We just, we decide to launch the chosen app where there's a whole bunch, this, this history is better recorded, but, um, we, we were deciding to launch the chosen app. And well, and, when we launched the first four episodes in the spring, we made seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars over that year. The trustee came in and he said, "You guys are doing so little. You've got to at least do one and a half million this Christmas season on episodes five, or else eight. I don't see how the, you're going to make it." Yeah, he says you have to make at least one point five million dollars on episodes five through eight. I tell Dallas, I say, "Let's get the episodes out by by Thanksgiving." Yeah. And he says, that's really pushing it, but we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. We'll get him out by Thanksgiving. And he did it in an amazing time. He did it. Yes, they did it. And they, they worked like crazy. And then I called Dallas after we had come up with this idea of pay it forward. Whereas you watch the episode for free, somebody else paid it for, paid for you. And then you can pay it forward for others. I called Dallas and I said, Dallas, here's the idea for the show for episodes five through eight. He's a little skeptical, but Amanda's like, that's it. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. The gospel should be free. <clears throat> that's the model that I like. And I said, Dallas, let's meet up because we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to um, get to an change of all of our, yeah, we're going to have to change everything. Yep. And, and we got to get an agreement in place that represents 
this new change. Because we had this perpetual agreement for SVOD, because subscription video on demand, because we thought we were going to be the, a Netflix, like a Netflix competitor. And so we just had rights to the chosen in perpetuity for that. And now we're going to offer a free and not make any money off of it through our subscription. So we said, we've got to do a new agreement that basically represents now what we're, yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, the changes to this new model. Yeah. And, and so I explained it to him and he says, Jeff, I'm in editing to get this out by Thanksgiving. We can't meet till the beginning of November. And I'm like, Dallas, we need to meet now because it will, he's like, no, we can just launch the other episodes the same way as we launched these ones. Let's raise money for season two. And he's, you know, just like, let's, let's take our time. <laughs> and I got off the phone with him and I was like, uh, Neil, I need the team. We've got to build the app as if Dallas is going to agree to this. <laughs> It absolutely, because there's not time. There's we've not got, time. We're, 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 we, and I said, we've already started. Yeah, and so we put the entire company on this new app before Dallas and we had met other than a phone <laughs> call, assuming that in November he's going to say, let's do it, right? Let's change things to work this way. Yeah. And because we have to, we're going to have from Thanksgiving till December 31st to make $1.5 million dollars or else we're chapter seven. Like he's going to liquidate, the, the trustee's going to liquidate the company. And so we're just cranking on this app. Um, we meet with them in November. They agree. And we switch the SVOD over to pay it forward. So we switch from perpetual SVOD to perpetual pay where it forward. Where we can make money off of the other Yeah, things where we stuff. make money off the other stuff. And, and we're just cranking and cranking and everything's just like, down to the wire, there's so many things that could go wrong with what we're doing and launching a chosen app. And finally we get it out at Thanksgiving and it starts working. And we got to exactly like, right? One just point, over 1. 5 million, just over 1.5 million. <laughs> million. And then it just keeps climbing and it keeps climbing. And, by, and then COVID hit. Yeah. But by March, even before COVID it hit. It was climbing. Yeah. He's submitting, the trustee is submitting to the judge to say, Disney, We'll pay off all of your, all, the entire 62 plus, plus interest over a 14 year period. And Disney comes back and says, no, they need to be in chapter seven. And the judge is like, wait a second. I thought the goal is to get paid back. You don't want to be paid back. And then the judge started saying, if you're not even willing to act in your own interest as a company, I can't trust that you're not a predator. So the judge is starting to say, I'm not going to shut them down. I think we all know that Disney's a predator, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so. That would unfold over time. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, we, COVID hits, we decide to make the app, we do some tweaks to make it to where it's free all the time. You don't have to wait for somebody to pay it forward. The, the pay it forward is just catch up. And it's working. It's working. It's just skyrocketing. We hit Easter and COVID at the same time, everybody's going in their house. They're sick of all the HBO and Netflix content, and they all start wanting something more uplifting. And it just explodes in growth. And so the trustee's strong argument goes to like an invincible argument with the judge. Then we file our appeals because our attorney who had watched the trial, he said that was just a garbage trial. I'm going to appeal for you guys for basically almost nothing, right? And and so he files the appeal to the upper court and Disney starts losing $50 million a day. And 25, yeah. Oh, 25 million yep. a day? Yep. I don't know. I thought it was 50. Okay. Um, anyway, they, they're losing tons of money every single day because their parks are shut down. So they're getting pressure from their side. And as soon as we file the appeal, we start getting, they get a new, they switch out their attorneys and a new attorney comes in and he says, we want a settlement. And they start working on a settlement. And they settled, they just said, just don't filter our stuff, don't skip our stuff. With your tech. And we will settle for seven point whatever million dollars, which is less than the attorney fees. I mean, our, our attorneys say the public numbers are, are low that they had released in the thing, but our attorney said they spent at least $30 million trying to destroy our company. So they come in at $7 million, they just say, we're gonna cut our losses, and we're not gonna we're not gonna charge the sixty two point five. You just don't appeal. You agree not to appeal, 
and I, after the recent rulings, I'm like, would we have won? Because <laughs> um, it's... It, but we went to all of our investors and said, hey, guys, we said we'd fight this. What do you want to do? We've got this opportunity to start a studio. We have Dry Bar Comedy. With Dry Bar and The Chosen. We can fight this battle all the way to the top, and we don't know whether we'll win. And they overwhelmingly voted this way. And then... They um, said... They said Settle with Disney and move on. Yes, move on. We want to go after the stories. And there were a few people who were upset and uh, we offered them uh, to buy out their shares. And uh, so it worked out really well. So so we are out. And I remember just thinking that um, that those kind of prophetic prayers ended up being totally like right and um it's always easier in hindsight to see that and then to record it and kind of do your stones like joshua um the um and then i mean this is just this is just one side of the miracle world i mean the way the chosen i mean there was another threat that came as during covid is we couldn't get a set and um yeah that was on season two couldn't get a set and all of our people because of covid malta was out uh we were going to go to bulgaria i mean, it was it was a mess and no one no there was no set people option. inside of our company other companies friends all tried to get the set all no uh, to get a set and it the was no no, the, no 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 that the church the church of jesus christ latter-day saints had built this set 10 years before that's like this huge I mean, it takes like an hour to walk around the set. It's, it's like an acre of, or a couple acres of property. And you can see it inside the behind the scenes. But we were trying to get that set because we're like, maybe that set will work during COVID. And we had tried and tried and just, they had said no. And we were hitting bureaucratic, bureaucratic roadblocks everywhere. <clears throat> and then Dallas gets on. Tried for years, Jeff. Years. I remember two being years. meetings about that like years ago. And, yeah. and Dallas said the first time he walked on that set that he had these very strong feelings that the show would be filmed there. And so he was confused because there were, we had been told no at least seven times. And every single person on our team had gotten told no on trying to get that. And this was also a concern. This was right around the time of settlement. And we, we really felt like the leverage of knowing that there's a set and season two is being filmed because one of the arguments Disney could make is – they film season one, but can they even keep this going, you know? Sure. And um, Dallas Gilt goes to the farm where they shot the, the Shepherd episode in Chicago. And he's sitting there and he asks everyone to pray that, they, that we can get a set. And that day, a senior member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles inside of the church, his secretary comes in. And she says, you, I just watched the most amazing series over the weekend called The Chosen. You really need to watch it. And then he gets a phone call from somebody who had watched the video of Dallas asking everybody to pray. And he had an impression to call this, this, this member of the quorum of the, I mean, this is like the top of the top of the church. And, um, and he says, uh, calls and says, I, I just call him because I feel like I should call you about The Chosen, this TV series. And they're like, oh, we're talking about that right now. And he binges the whole entire show that day that Dallas asked everybody to pray. And then he go, and this, this guy who calls says, um, it's a friend, yeah. not, an, not an employee, not, not a member employee. of each team, just, just has somebody who just wanted to, call. to help. And he says, I just feel like I should call you and tell you that they need a set for season two. And the entire bureaucracy is reversed within a very short period of time. And this miracle to get this set happens. It, um, I'm not doing it justice, but. Well, doing okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Kyle, the story, uh, <laughs> that scripture that says that uh, the books, uh, that there aren't enough books that can be filled to tell <laughs> to tell the story of the, of the scriptures. Um, we've uh, we've come close to <laughs> 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 
<laughs> writing all those books in the, in this podcast. Like we're 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 giving you a very long version of the story. We're thank you for uh, for for doing that. But oh, we're going to cut this down to ten minutes. So okay, go. good. <laughs> good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you guys get the chosen out. Angel Studios is doing more original content now. Mm-hmm. Uh, more properties that you guys got, like uh, Wing Feather, Wing yes. Feather Saga. Yep. I know there's more, but more crowdfunding coming up for that soon. Mm-hmm. Tuttle Twins. Mm-hmm. What do you guys got in the works? There's the Wing Feather Saga. There's Mike, t- you got to tell them about David. There's Tuttle David, Twins. There's yeah. David, David, which is massive. A uh, South African uh, entrepreneur, the guy that um, Phil Cunningham grows up in a in Zimbabwe. His parents are missionaries. They went down to Zimbabwe to establish a mission. He grows up there. His farm doesn't even have electricity. He sees his first movie, I think when he was 15, 14, something like that. And he said he watched the movie and he came away from it and said, I'm going to be a filmmaker. And and then he goes down the Zimbazi River. I think I'm saying that right. But he goes down the river and you can go like five days without um, seeing anybody. And while he's on it, he's reading an ax and it says, I found in David a man after my own heart. And he said... If I can tell the story of David and his heart, God will know. People will know God's heart, and so he's building this series that he's been working on. It's like a it's like a life's work, and they are. I mean, their company does work for all the Hollywood studios animation work. They are very good, but it's a musical, um, like it, like Moana. It'll be or it'll be like Tangled. it'll it'll be like uh, Prince of Egypt in how epic it feels, but then it'll be fun animation and rewatchable like Moana and or And these Tangled. projects all cross ecumenical lines. That's mm-hmm. the thing that's so cool about them, right? I mean, yeah, with their, right their, in the dance. Matthew at NRB, um, there was one creator, he's from the UK, his name's Paul Searstadt. He is 30 years old. He's a prodigy, in my opinion. And he uh, watched The Chosen, was so inspired by The Chosen and the Angel Studios model that he did everything he could to put together a, a concept pilot like Dallas did The Shepherd. And then he found out we were going to be at NRB and he flew like last minute. NRB is National Religious Broadcasters. And right. to the NRB conference, showed up at the pitchathon, walked over to our table, said, I just flew in. I flew, you know, eight, eight, 12 hours, just found out about this. I came all the way here to, to share with you guys this project. And it's called the uh, Testament. And it's, um, it's uh, the Gospels uh, from from the Acts on, um, set in modern day. It's like mind blo- mind blowing the way he's approached it. Super cool. Um, but this this is happening like South Africa, um, UK, the UK. Uh, the, the, these shows are just popping There's guys up, up out of the world. Moscow, world. Idaho, that created the riot and the dance, which is like a planet Earth, but with God represent celebrating God in creation. Nashville. With uh, with the Wing Feather Saga and Andrew Peterson, mm-hmm. these sh- these shows, like every one of them, have the story that's that we just told, but their own story where they're trying to share something that the world is not accepting, that like the traditional Hollywood world, but that needs to be told, and uh, it's super exciting. So I don't know. If this is so much a question as it is a comment or an observation. So. You know, you guys are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, you're working with a lot of content creators who come from different denominations within Christianity, uh, you know, different places across the spectrum there, Um, like, you know, all around the world. We've got a Jew sitting here for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) And so what I've... (laughs) There's so many jokes that start and end that way, right? (laughs) (laughs) And what I've... I'll tell you what I feel. What I felt is that there's, we're in this paradoxical place where we can all acknowledge that we have theological divisions between us, like within our camps. Like we can say, I don't see eye to eye with you on on various aspects of theology, on the scriptures. You know, we, we accept well, different books. you're drinking books. coffee. I'm drinking coffee. Yeah. You guys want any? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um and at the same time, it feels like a lot of us have felt culturally that there's a bigger war outside of that. Mm-hmm. And it, and I don't ma- mean to make that sound like that war is more important because I think I think us having conversations about theology is as important, obviously has eternal implications. At the same time, it's like we see things in our country where, you know, our freedoms are under attack. 
we see the the woke stuff that Disney's putting out, we see attacks on our kids, and you find that with our backs against the wall, all of a sudden we're cooperating more in certain areas. Um, and I think there's a there's an interesting balance to be found there. It makes some people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think uh, there's there can be legitimate concerns there where we can say, oh, like how can we work together on this project or that project if we're not aligned and what kind of conversations do you guys have about that behind the scenes and what are your i don't know what's your take on that so i um i play basketball in the morning and when the chosen first came out i was buying the chosen for all of my friends and tried to get 100 people to watch it and uh gave out dvds and blu-rays to everybody that i play basketball with and it was like pulling teeth to get anybody to watch it <laughs> like nobody wanted to watch it and uh, th we'd get comments from time to time where people are like, hey, we don't know if we want, you know, this is some evangelical production. Because we gave all the creative rights to Dallas. Okay. It's, yeah. Uh, it's not. That's we, our studio model, actually. Is we don't take control over the creative. Yeah. So we're not, we're not putting any of our doctrines or anything into the show. We don't, okay. we don't have any influence on that. Piece. Yeah. And so they were feeling, you know, distrusting. And then when when we got season two, one of the one of the parts of the agreement is that BYU TV actually wanted to broadcast the shows. And they said, we'll give you the set if you'll broadcast on BYU TV. And we said, okay, great. As soon as it was on BYU TV, suddenly... I had friends at basketball saying, oh, I love The Chosen, you know? <laughs> it was just like, now that there's a sanctioned source sure, for sure. where they can receive it, it's suddenly okay. And before that, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't okay to watch it. So, um, you know, I'm sure that Dallas has experienced way more of that than, than, than we have. Um, uh, we're just, you know, when we were kids, it was, it was legal to... To, to, to shoot us in Missouri, <laughs> uh, but meaning w there, we've moved a long way forward. There, yeah, there were laws in the uh, up until the 1980s in Missouri that allowed you to kill a Mormon legally. Uh, <laughs> what state specifically are these? Missouri. Okay. Missouri. Yeah, and, and they yeah. got rid of that and apologized for it. But but they, <laughs> sorry about that killing thing, guys. <laughs> we just want to we want to roll that back a little bit. Yeah. But but uh, Dallas, we understand, has gotten a lot of flack uh, for working with us, and we're. We're just the distributors, marketers. Like we just want to get well, the show out. And I, I often like I wrote, I wrote a blog post about this. Um, why I am helping evangelicals build this show mm -hmm. and get it to the world. Why am I down in Brazil, spending five months with my family? Almost. I mean, my wife said halfway through, she's like, "It's like we're serving a mission down here." Mm -hmm. I know we're here for work, but it feels like we're serving a mission. We're just meeting with all kinds of um, people and um, and why why are we doing this over a show that is done by somebody who doesn't even have the same doctrinal views as us? And, th and there's significant differences between doctrines. I don't think we should make light of the doctrinal differences. And I, I wrote in it just that if God can call a like apostate tax collector that you know, if you're a tax collector and a Jew, you were just completely ostracized from like Matthew and, and totally ignorant, um, fisherman and, and goes and calls a Samaritan who the Jews believed had doctrines that were completely incompatible with their Jewish world. Right. Matthew. You yeah. They weren't my, my, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is it wasn't even, it wasn't, Judaism, it was almost yeah. seen as a different a different religion. But that's the first person he goes and calls. Why can't he call evangelical Jews, Catholics, and even Latter Day Saints? And from a Latter Day Saint perspective, we would say even evangelicals. <laughs> but <laughs> but the yeah, even the Baptists. <laughs> but 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 why can't he call all of us to work on a show like this? Um, and, 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 and honestly, the way, the way I feel about it is I, whatever they say, it doesn't change my relationship with Christ. I know Jesus Christ. I've accepted him. He saved me. And I know what my relationship is. And so I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help the show regardless and, 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 and I help get it to the world. So, um, but I, I've tried to explain some of our, some of my views on why 
I'm okay letting Dallas have full control over the the content. Well, and the other weird thing too is that if we if he didn't go through Angel Studios or some partner that's outside Hollywood, he'd be getting it distributed by godless atheist mm-hmm. uh, child sacrificing <laughs> Satan worship. These are all technicalities, kind of. <laughs> drink baby blood or whatever out in Hollywood. So uh, just a theory, just a, just a theory. But um, yeah, so it's weird that we feel comfortable with that, but not this. And I guess it, some of that is the doctrinal distinction and fuzziness mm-hmm. and it, where do you set boundaries and lines. And But yeah, that's a good perspective. We all have that, that our sincere belief, you know, you have your sincere belief, your relationship with Christ, yep. you know, you have your perspective on that. We have our perspective on what that looks like. And we can disagree on those things and yet say at the same time we have similar goals externally you know in in the in the culture war or whatever you Mm -hmm. want to call it yeah well and also just i mean uh, as one last note is um the i can understand because this is like the most important part of people's life their faith right so i understand um watch the show Judge let it fruits. speak for itself. Let let these things uh, speak for themselves by their fruits and and uh, and if it, and if something that Dallas and his team have created unites us all a little bit more in this world, that's we'll take it. <laughs> Let's move into our ten questions, and I'm sure we'll all, we'll all keep we'll all keep chatting well beyond this. But um, we ask every guest the same ten questions. The ten questions. Have you ever met Carmen? Carmen? Yeah, he's a he's a Christian rapper. No. Okay. Have you ever met Carmen? I, no. I have you ever met victim Carmen? That I have to do this first. Okay. Um, <laughs> are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? <laughs> I plead the fifth. On- <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, predestination or free will. If you had to fall somewhere on that spectrum. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I'll just say this: the the Torah teaches that you need to. Trust God and work your behind off. So where do you put me on that scale? You're an Arminian. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Um, <laughs> Calvinist or Arminian? More on the free will camp. On the free will side. Yeah. Yeah, free will. Free will. Okay. You get to... Oh, have... I think I was predestined to marry my wife. She's amazing. Okay. See, <laughs> what a Calvinist. <laughs> uh, you get to add one book to the Bible. What is it? Uh, usually people pick their favorite book or, you know, something that everybody should read. Um, well, you know... Uh, in our tradition, we have so much, you know, this this tradition of like the oral mm-hmm. Torah that yeah. that that there's so much. I I wouldn't add a thing because I can't possibly even get to the stuff that's our, <laughs> that's, sure, that the rabbis sure. have already written. All right, what's your second favorite book besides the Bible? Completely unrelated. Uh, ex, uh, Exodus by Leon Uris. Okay, cool. Uh, I'd say outside of the scriptures, the book that impact me the most is uh, Les Mis. Oh, okay. Especially the very first book, because it's it's six books, but the one about uh, the bishop, or it's called Fontaine. Okay. Uh, that book changed my life. Oh, awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, to stream a thought, probably not well thought out, but uh, How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen had a huge impact okay. on me. Uh, whiskey or beer? Whiskey. All right. Lahayam. Uh, whiskey or beer? Whiskey has more uses for those who don't drink alcohol. <laughs> do whiskey. Oh, you're drinking it. I didn't, <laughs> didn't expect you to say whiskey. But. <laughs> Remember, they are the, they create a dry bar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Jeff, uh, so whiskey I'll or beer? I'll take their whiskey. Uh, same answer as Neil. It's, okay. uh, whiskey would have more whiskey uses. For non- would have more uses for non-drinking. Purposes. I'll take your yeah. whiskey. Right. It's my thing to bear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you get to hang out with any three people, living or dead. Who are they? Oh, my goodness. And uh, you guys can jump in if uh, one of you has your list ready. Feel free. Uh, Jesus, for sure. Oh, you can't pick Jesus. Oh, you can't? Ah. <laughs> you, said uh. living, you said living or dead? Yeah. Well, wow, Jesus okay. is living, but okay. you can't pick George, him. George Washington would be one. I need to think a little bit. Um, my grandpa. Okay. He passed away. I love my grandpa, yeah. Frank. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to meet Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay. That would count for more than three people. Yeah, they, they say that's up to seven. So. Yeah, okay. Does that count? Am I done? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Matthew. Come on, Matthew. Help uh, I'm fascinated by, uh, I'll just throw it out what comes to my head. John Quincy Adams. Okay. I love, yeah. I love 
the duty is ours, the consequences are his. I think what an amazing man. Um, David, uh, a poet, a, a warrior, uh, so many things, What and yet unremarkable. What the heck is this guy like? Um, he would be one. And then uh, uh, the Rebbe. I don't know if you've heard of the Rebbe, mm. but he's uh, he's uh, probably the most impactful rabbi okay. in our lifetime and and uh, an absolutely fascinating person. Okay. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson would be another one. All right. So you got I, I've got a lot, but there's three. That's good. No, you got a big yeah. three. So there yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, I think... Did you only do Grandpa so far? Yeah, Isaiah. Yeah. I'd love to meet Isaiah. Okay. Um, That's a good one, Neil. That's yeah, a good, good one. one. Yeah. Uh, and I've done two, huh? Yeah. We're all waiting on you. I mean, George... I would definitely <laughs> say George Washington. I was trying to come come up with something outside of of Washington. Um, Great, yeah. All right, that's a good group of people to hang out with. Uh, cigars or pipes? Cigars. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's tough because pipes are pipes. Can I change my answer? Yeah, you can change. Sure. Okay, pipes. And again, you're going to get stuck with those guys. Yeah, so, why don't you guys just pick the thing that Kyle and I are going to have well, to do? Well, maybe. <laughs> Like, uh, you know. And and I'll give you. You can have bacon. I I, I gotta leave pipes, the bacon. Pipes out. look cooler than cigars. See, yeah. There you go. So pipes. <laughs> I'll do cigars. Okay. Just to be different. Yeah. Cool. It could be a bubble pipe. Those were very popular when I was. Yeah. Kid. Yeah. But I, I, I I'm saying that with the understanding that I wouldn't pick either. But yeah. <laughs> yeah I got it. Well, I do it because I I think I I know some people who would like the cigars, so I give it to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's perfect. Perfect. Uh. What would be the first thing you would do as president? Uh, I would cut the bureaucracy by 85%, and that's probably a, a conservative estimate. Conservative number, yeah. yeah. Uh, of the things that president can do, you know, I'd love to focus on our own defense. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, all over the world. Good, yeah. Go through all the executive orders that have been written that the president did illegally and undo them. Great. Oh, I like that. Great. I'll vote for you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, question number eight. Have you ever punched anyone or been punched? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, yeah, I guess any of you can jump in. Yeah, so uh, third grade, playing tackle football, uh, which we shouldn't have been doing. There was a friend who had cowboy boots. He kicked me in the face in the in the pile as we were tackling people. I pulled him out of the pile and punched him in the nose. <laughs> Man, a week later we were we were friends and yeah. playing together at each other's house. But yeah, that was one time. Yeah, Jeff, have you ever punched? I've anyone? been punched. Yeah, yeah. Is it a and good I story punched. or a traumatic story? Or um, just there was a kid that had got to the baseball diamond first, and so he was supposed to pitch, and the other kid kicked him off, and so I went and confronted the other kid and said, hey, he was here first. That's the rules. And then I won that little thing. But then this kid that was way bigger than everybody had been held back a grade, like jumped me on the playground later. And he punched me pretty hard. Um, so yeah, I was bloodied from that. Awesome. Cool. Uh, have you ever punched anyone or been punched? This is not a fair question because I studied boxing for a while. Sure. So people punched me and I punched them all yeah, the time. Outside of the ring. Outside of... Yeah. There may have been a college roommate who had something coming and there may have yeah. been a few punches exchanged. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. What is the... But uh, we're men. We clear that stuff up. What does the rabbinic way. tradition say about them? <laughs> <laughs> any, any the rabbinic tradition says you're supposed to yell at each other over a theological question. But it should, you know, but but, yeah. but it doesn't come to blows. But everybody who's not Jewish thinks it's about to come to blows. So usually when you're learning a particular thing, you're in each other's face and people walk by like, what's about to happen to both of you guys? And then you just stop and go, we're learning. What We're studying. What's your, what's your problem? We're just yelling at each other. What, you know. Yeah. This is vigorous uh, right, debate. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, question number nine. Uh, you get to go to any concert of any band in history, who do you pick? And you can't pick Imagine Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I want to see. That is so I just, good. I just watched the Elvis movie. I would have loved to have gone to one oh, of his Elvis. concerts. Yeah. yeah, when he was younger. Yeah, for sure. That would have been super fun. Yes, Elvis. Uh, it would have been one of the swing bands. Okay. Um, sing, sing, sing. 
All right. Hear that live by the original. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. Got to see, I mean, Sinatra, to see Sinatra in concert would have been. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, uh, whoo. Yeah, amazing. Okay, great. All right, final question. Uh, with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, uh, will you accept uh, the Baptist Jesus as your Lord and Savior? <laughs> the Trinitarian uh, Christ. <laughs> Modify the question a little. <laughs> we will get in trouble for this. <laughs> Can I interest you? <laughs> I love that you, you just qualified that question. <laughs> um, well, it, does, it seems like I didn't convert anybody today, but um, still, it was a good, it was a good podcast. So, thanks for coming out, guys. This has been awesome. And, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, everybody, check out the Chosen and, and all the upcoming uh, crowdfunding campaigns. From yeah, Angel.com.